Hi, and welcome to our podcast, Conversations with Pene Brith. I'm CEO Dan Mariash. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Adina Newman, creator of My Family Genie and the DNA Reunion Project, which helps link Holocaust survivors to living relatives they didn't know they had. But first, if you enjoy this program, subscribe to Conversations with Pene Brith wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook for all of our latest content. As interest in genealogy continues to grow exponentially in the 21st century, we now have the invaluable ability to trace our ancestry in ways we never knew possible, with connections we never expected. One unforeseen but beautiful outcome, linking Holocaust survivors to living relatives they did not know they had an especially priceless gift as the number of survivors dwindles with the passage of time. Leading the effort to piece together family trees for survivors and their families is Dr. Adina Newman, who is my guest and, in the interest of full disclosure, happens to be a relative of mine. Together with Jennifer Mendelson, Newman leads the DNA Reunion Project, a program piloted through the Center for Jewish History in New York, to raise awareness about the potential of DNA testing within the Holocaust survivor community. Today, Adina and I will be talking about the project's mission, what genetic genealogy and Jewish genealogy are, how DNA testing can benefit Holocaust survivors and anybody looking to learn more about their family history, and some of the meaningful genetic matches and mended family trees the project has helped uncover. Dr. Adina Newman, the creator of My Family Genie and co-founder of the DNA Reunion Project, is a professional genealogist and educator. She specializes in Ashkenazi Jewish genetic genealogy and regularly presents in a variety of venues, from major genealogy conferences to local genealogy societies. Newman's work has received international media attention, including mentions in the Washington Post, the Associated Press, Today, People, the Daily Mail, and the Times of Israel. And she's appeared on several news outlets such as NPR and I-24 News. She also volunteers as a moderator for a 10,000-member Jewish Genetic Genealogy Facebook group and lectures on various genealogical topics related to Jewish genealogy and DNA. Adina, so nice to see you, and thanks for being with us today. Great to Thank have you. you. Thank you for having me. I always love when I have the opportunity to talk about the work that we do and get people as excited as I am about the potential of DNA testing. Well, before we delve into your work with the DNA Reunion Project, mm -hmm. uh, talk to us first about your work as a genealogist and about genetic genealogy and Jewish genealogy, specifically Jewish genetic genealogy. What are they and what inspired you to eventually specialize in Ashkenazi Jewish communities? So I think like a lot of people, I was curious about my own family, which is also, you know, your family. Um, it all started, I think I was fortunate enough to grow up with stories hearing about the family. And I think that really sets the path for a lot of people. You know, you hear these legends and you want to know uh, what the truth is to them. And certainly when I started my own family, I definitely wanted to uh, dive deeper into what was possible. So I learned about resources uh, such as a major Jewish genealogy resource called Jewish Gen. Uh, and I started looking into the family. And of course, I reached out to family members and asked questions. And I think for me, I love history. I love learning languages. I love talking to people, meeting people, and it just kind of all fit together. I would say that I think my genealogy hobby turned more professional career when I did take a DNA test. And I took a DNA test a few years ago. And that is what we talk about when we mean genetic genealogy. Genetic genealogy is really just taking those commercial DNA tests like Ancestry, 23andMe, uh, MyHeritage, for example, and interpreting them, analyzing them. Uh, so that is where I got started. And when I took that test, you know, if you are an Ashkenazi Jew, as I am 100%, that will be your ethnicity estimate. And people think this is useless. I already knew that. I didn't need to take a test for that. But uh, as I always say, the meat is in the matches. And if you are Ashkenazi Jewish, you tend to have, uh, if you're on Ancestry, you will probably have about 200,000 matches. Uh, and I'm, my job is to kind of 
go through all of them and figure out which ones are meaningful and how you're related to them. So I got really interested in all of this because I had some matches that didn't quite make sense in the family. They did not match my family tree and I started to explore them and I started to learn more. And then I started helping people. They would ask me for my assistance and it kind of, uh, it ballooned from there. You know, you start with yourself and then you help other people. And why I specialize in Ashkenazi Jewish? Well, that's what I am. So it kind of fell into my lap uh, organically in that way. I will say that there is a bit of a twist to uh, particularly Ashkenazi Jewish DNA is because we are effectively a tribe. We did, we're all cousins with each other. So our DNA reflects that. That's why we have about 200,000 matches on Ancestry. Uh, we can't trace all of these matches, but I can probably, you know, I think my partner and I, Jennifer Mendelson, which I'll talk about the project later, I think we share some DNA with each other. So perhaps that, that's the genealogy gene. So uh, that's my specialty. I take this very uh, niche piece of working with DNA to help people find their families, and I focus on the Jewish community. What are some of the key developments in DNA testing analysis from the last few decades? We're in the 21st century, and like everything else in the 21st century, um, you know, if you wait a week, uh, there's yeah. something new. Um, so what developments have uh, come up over the last number of years that have allowed you and Jennifer to piece together family trees? So I would say that really it, it is a 21st century phenomenon. It started more with what's called a Y DNA, or an, uh, which is the patrilineal line. You know, you test and you can find out uh, your father's 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 deep ancestry or mitochondrial DNA, the mother's 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 line. That's where it started. Uh, there's not as much genealogical use for these tests. They're more scientific. They can be helpful for genealogy. There are plenty of examples. But more recently, in the last decade or so, uh, we're talking more about autosomal DNA tests. And that's looking at, you know, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 pairs of those are your autosomes. So that's what that means. So they look at the whole picture. So it doesn't matter if you're male or female testing. And when you take a test at these commercial databases, you are compared against the other people in the database. So also as these databases grow and Ancestry, I think is close to, I wanna say 25 million at this point uh, with people testing, I could be off on that number, but certainly a lot uh, over 20 million, um, you can find potential more family members. So as that happens, you know, people like Jennifer and I are able to find potential more family for people, you know, just by virtue of them testing. So, I mean, that's been the major change as uh, going with the Holocaust piece of it, the more people in the database, the more opportunities for us to find people. And I think personally for me, um, you know, I did all of this work for biological families, you know, people who don't know who their parents are or grandparents, things like that. And there was just a natural progression uh, into the Holocaust community because there are so, so many people who think everything was destroyed in the Holocaust, that the Holocaust just kind of destroyed all the history. Um, it is a big myth, actually, in the genealogy and even just the Jewish world that all the records were destroyed. And I want to really, if anyone picks up anything from this, uh, me talking today, it's that there is so much there. All the records were not destroyed. There was not a uh, systematic, let's destroy all the Jewish records. Uh, to the contrary, there are a lot of records that we might have uh, that we wouldn't have if not for the Holocaust, or that we do have not um that we wouldn't have otherwise. So I have, you know, certain Holocaust record sets, but there are so many vital records, birth records, marriage records, death records. So it's definitely worth pursuing uh, your family history there. And we just try to piece families together and give people the closure that they deserve. Yeah, I remember um, looking into, when I started visiting Eastern Europe and uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, I would go to um, to Lithuania, mm -hmm. uh, to, to Vilna, Vilnius mm -hmm. capital. Um, and uh, was uh, told by some friends there uh, that there was a, um, uh, a telephone directory uh, from 1940 that might be helpful in the search for uh, one of our relatives, and yes. we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, even a telephone directory certainly, I think, can uh, can can open a, a path to uh, to a wider um, a sense of. of finding out who you are. But I want to go back to DNA for a second. Mm -hmm. What do you tell participants um, who are wary of doing DNA testing? Do you still find that or is it is there less resistance to it because 
everybody does it and your friends do it and your relatives do it. So why shouldn't you do it? Yeah. So I, I, there's something out there called DNA exceptionalism. So people think that you give your DNA away and all these horrible, terrible potential things can happen. Um, I try to explain to people that, first of all, you're shedding DNA throughout your day, uh, first of all. So I try to kind of put it into perspective. But really, when I do the work I do, yes, they take a DNA test. And I this is, you know, I try not to alarm people, but I'm not finding you because you took a DNA test. That just gets me started. You know, people leave digital footprints all the time. So anyone like me can dig in and find out you know, your yearbook photo, I can find your family and friends, your social media, I can find lots and lots of things about you. And it has nothing to do with your DNA test that just got me started. So I think that people, you know, I never want to coerce anyone into taking a DNA test. If you firmly believe that, you know, this is, this is just something you cannot do, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. I always encourage people to read the terms of service with any site. But for me, any benefits to this completely outweigh any potential implications. I'm on every, I, and I, and I'm preaching, uh, I'm on every possible DNA site. I'm out there. Uh, there are a lot of professional genetic genealogists that might share their entire genome and say, here, have at it, because there's really not much that can be done, uh, with somebody's DNA. It's just kind of, I think people feel like this is theirs and it's unique to them. So there are privacy concerns there, but I want people to kind of just have the bigger picture of what's happening when we do this type of work. Let's talk about the DNA reunion project. There's um, there's an urgency yeah. uh, to this, uh, given the fact that the number of survivors uh, is just um, uh, raising uh, uh, the number of people who are no longer here to tell the story. Um, and that's one part of it. Survivors. Um, and the the very rapid rate with which they're now passing. Uh, But also, the question that I had was, I suppose many survivors think they they know what happened to their parents, their brothers, their sisters, aunts and uncles. Maybe they've been back to Eastern Europe, to to the scenes of these crimes. Um, Maybe they've advertised in in Jewish newspapers or, or in other places. And they've come to the conclusion that there's nobody else out there. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you meet that need to find out, to really push it to the limit uh, to either find uh, living relatives or not? So, you know, we don't like to promise anything uh, completely exceptional, but, you know, it's very common that even though people think they know their entire family tree, they don't. Um, And part of that is simply because a lot of these survivors did not have the opportunity to, you know, spend time with their grandparents and hear the family history. It just that that was taken away from them. So I like we like to talk about our first really DNA test that came back to us. She has this whole narrative. She's written about it. She's presented. She knows everybody in the family. She took a DNA test and there was a second cousin match there. And Jennifer and I dug into it. And very quickly, we learned that this was a full second cousin, because this uh, Holocaust survivor did not know that her grandmother had a brother who immigrated to the United States, you know, at the turn of the 20th century and had a whole family, you know, in Canada and the United States. So we were able to uh, kind of link them back together. And that's commonly what we see. I mean, I have plenty of stories of surprise, uh, you know, uncles that survived or maybe siblings, and we can talk more about that. But commonly, you know, just finding a second cousin, a third cousin, when you think that everybody in the world was taken from you is giving something back and reuniting families. And it's just so, so powerful. And it's typically the kind of thing that we see. And how do you get the word out to the survivor community? Because again, passing of time um, and people, I suppose, want to, I don't know how long this process takes. And you might tell us about mm-hmm. that um, in terms of Uh, the time frame between somebody approaching you and you're coming up with the connection to a second cousin or to some other distant relative. So tell us about that. So we've given away about, I'd say, 1,300 kits in a year. Part of this is because, uh, as you mentioned, this is at-risk history. So Ancestry, one of the big genealogy companies, 
uh, saw what we were doing and they donated 2,500 kits to our program. So we're able to send those out to them as soon as people submit for those kits. And then, you know, like any site, you wait, you know, four to six weeks, basically, for your results to come back. And again, that is a long time uh, for the survivor community. And we've learned that uh, the hard way sometimes. Uh, but once they get the results back, they can share it with Jennifer and myself, and we, they give us basically, you know, even just who their parents were, if they know, or their grandparents, and we start digging in, or we give consults to them to kind of tell them where to take it. Uh, so it just depends. You know, sometimes Jennifer and I figured out big things in a matter of hours, uh, and I'm not exaggerating there. Sometimes it takes weeks and weeks, especially for, and I'm happy to talk about, you know, cases of hidden children, uh, you know, kid, children that were sent to orphanages just to save their lives, things like that. Those take a lot longer. Uh, to, to do. Do you find that the children and grandchildren of survivors are, are coming to you now? Because they also um, are, I'm sure, are eager uh, to see if there's uh, anyone out there. Yes. Yeah, so our test, um, we, as part of our program, we provide free tests to survivors and their children. Uh, 3G at this time, we could not meet that demand, but also the DNA. If you take a test, you only receive 50% of your parents' DNA and it gets kind of watered down every generation. So it's more difficult working with 3G DNA. Um, so right now we're giving kits to survivors and their children. And we do find that for a lot of these second generation, it's filling a hole for them because they grew up hearing or maybe their parents didn't even want to talk about it, which is very common. So us being able to find records for them even, let alone family members, just means the world to them because they could never ask their parents those questions. So let's go back to the basic work that you do. If you could walk us through um, the the basics of your work mm -hmm. when finding and verifying evidence, uh, whether you're creating or extending a family tree or for any other purpose. So ideally, when we do this work, you know, somebody already knows their family. So we have some workings of a tree. Maybe they gave that to us or maybe they gave us parents or grandparents. And then we're building using what's available to us. So perhaps uh, they're from Poland. There is a, uh, we have a partnership with the JRI Poland. Uh, they kind of collect all the Jewish Polish records and they index them. And so they have given us uh, scores and scores of records the, uh, the of the process. Jewish Research Institute in Poland. Yes, in Poland. Correct. Yes. So, uh, you know, we call it JRI Poland. And then there's also something similar called Gesher Galicia uh, for Galicia, and they do similar work. Uh, so we get lots and lots of records. So as I said, we start with DNA and DNA can give us um, possible relationships. So you share a certain amount. So, uh, you know, Dan, if you take a DNA test, you and I are going to share a certain amount of DNA that would be typical of our relationship. OK, uh, so we start there. But there are also lots of possibilities based on the amount of DNA. So, uh, for example, a first cousin once removed shares in the same ballpark as a half first cousin. But if I have a tree, I can make heads or tails of which is the correct value. If you don't know that, then you have to do a little bit more digging. So uh, the cases that Jennifer and I uh, particularly focus on are the ones that um, people don't know their trees at all. So an example I would give is we helped somebody who was smuggled out of the Bialystok ghetto. She did not know the identity of her parents. She kind of, for decades, uh, literally traveled the world to try to figure out who her parents were. Uh, and she it felt like she got some information, but unfortunately we were working with names like Shapiro. And there are a lot of Shapiros out there. So, you know, Jennifer and I got hold of her case and we analyzed her DNA matches and uh, they weren't superb DNA matches, but we were able to build trees for them. So what you do is we reverse engineer. We take the DNA matches of people um, so she knew nobody, but her DNA matches knew some of their family. And we tried to see where we could connect the dots. And then what we did was we would get records. We got lots of records uh, from Jewish Gen. We mentioned uh, Grodno uh, was where the family seemed to be from and a lot from JRI Poland. And we built the tree. We also used resources like Yisker books. I think people need to realize that sometimes there's nothing left for a town but people's memories. So I was very fortunate to see that uh, we had a Yisker book where somebody remembered where everybody lived and they created a map of the Jewish community in this town. And uh, the people in question that we were looking for, the names on our DNA uh, tests, were living next door to each other. And when it all kind of came to pass, we were in Bialystok and we found a marriage record for this client's parents. 
based on all the DNA. So we had all grandparents' lines lead to her. So that's kind of how the work works effectively. We take other people, or DNA matches, we take their trees and try to find where everybody comes together. And then we keep building and building until we find where the person should fit within that family. You mentioned Bialystok. Uh, how much of this work, and I know it's all on an individual basis, mm -hmm. uh, would require you uh, or Jennifer to, to go on site, uh, to go to city halls and, and archives abroad. So it's really important to understand that not everything is on the internet when you're doing genealogy. Uh, we typically will hire an on-the-ground researcher in that area. Uh, working with J.R.I. Poland, they have a lot of uh, people on the ground that they work with, but we have hired uh, people who specialize in areas of Hungary or in Israel uh, just to help us out. So uh, we do that contract work because we say, we need this. Can you pull this record for us? Or can you translate this? That kind of thing. So no, not everything can be done by us, but we're facilitating getting a lot of those records for us to help us with the DNA matches. Uh, has the uh, knowledge and the experience that you've gained over the years enabled you to trust your instincts and your intuition uh, when you're seeking information? I'd say 100% when you do this every day, uh, which as I do, um, I you get a sense for things. So, I mean, I'm thinking about this Bialystok case where we were dealing with the names Shapiro and Kaplan. And I was going through all of the index records and I was looking at naming patterns also because I was so engrossed in this family. And I said, I think this will be a grandchild. I think this will be a grandchild. I think this will be a grandchild. And when we finally got the spreadsheet from J.R.I. Poland, I was right about every single person that they were part of this family. Just because I, I'm used to doing this. Um, you can you get a lot from Jewish naming patterns. That's actually very important when working with Jewish genealogy. So yes, I'd certainly say, you know, looking at DNA amounts and how much people share, I get a great sense of how they probably do share. Again, it's really important in this work to not, you know, I think a lot of people in genealogy, they see, oh, somebody did my tree for me already on Ancestry. But it's really important to verify everything. Uh, I have fixed many a tree. I've seen many a tree be wrong. They're great starting points. And I don't want people to be complacent and say, I don't need that tree. But you have to verify all of the, the records that might be attached or the people they say or their family members. So uh, definitely you develop an intuition for this kind of work. I think that's a great way to put it. Can you uh, share with us um, one or two of your success stories mm -hmm. uh, when you've re reunited survivors with living family members? Uh, discoveries uh, maybe made through the DNA reunion project uh, that profoundly changed survivors' uh, lives or their descendants' lives Absolutely. for the better. Absolutely. And I love telling these stories. Uh, the first case that Jennifer and I did together was for Jackie Young. Uh, so Jackie, uh, he basically we came about the story because he was on a BBC show called DNA Secrets, and it went all around the Jewish genealogy world. Uh, his story is that he was a child survivor of Theresienstadt, uh, and he was sent to the UK. He always knew he was adopted, but he did not learn until he was getting married and had to collect his papers that he was a child survivor of Theresienstadt uh, and that uh, he was born in Vienna. So he had his birth certificate and had his mother listed on it, but not his father. So I think he spent much of his life thinking that, how did I survive? Was my father a Nazi? So uh, he took a DNA test with the show and it showed he was 100% Ashkenazi Jewish and they were able to uh, introduce him to some paternal relatives. But independently, Jennifer and I were wondering why, who, how, are, how is he related to these people? How are they able to connect him to these people? But where, who are his, who's his father? So uh, as Jewish geography works, as I as was mentioned in my bio, I am a moderator for a Jewish DNA group and somebody in the group's parent was next door neighbors to Jackie. So that's how it all kind of came together. And we said, Jackie, we'd love to help you. Will you give us access to your DNA? And he said, sure, have at it. So I would I think I want to say that once Jennifer and I got access to all of his DNA results, we figured out a candidate for his biological father in four days. And four days, and we sat a little bit on it because the next step is even though you find a candidate, you need to find a DNA tester to help prove it. So we found literally only one person in the United States, a potential first cousin once removed, who could take a DNA test. 
And finally, I bit the bullet and I said, I'm calling this man. So I, I called him and I kind of explained the the little elevator speech. You know, I'm, I'm my name is Adina. I'm part of this project, all of this and crickets. And I said, oh, I, I, I ruined it. We're not going to know. We're never going to know. And then he goes back. Oh, I have bad reception. Let me take this outside. Uh, so my heart, you know, it started beating after that. So he agreed to take a test. And he tested as a first cousin once removed, as we suspected. We found another first cousin once removed in France. And we sent her a test. And it also showed up as a first cousin once removed. And for Jackie, and there's a beautiful picture, He, we made him a whole tree on Ancestry. He printed it out and had it framed. So he has it prominently displayed on his wall. He loves pointing to it. He went from nothing to all of this. Um, you know, it's not all wonderful stories. We found he had a half brother who perished in the Holocaust as well. You know, we, he learned this information, but it gave him the closure and it gave his family closure because his children grew up with these stories of not, you know, they had to hear their father talk about this and worry about it. So it gave them a sense of closure as well. So that that's one example. Um, another example I can give because I have all these different types of stories is that uh, we come about a lot of these cases because they're in the news. So there was a case of two sisters who independently at the behest of their grandchildren said, take a test, granny, we need to know. So they lived in Poland. And so their granddaughters got them 23 and me tests. And they were both orphaned around 1942 uh, in Poland. So they take the, these tests and they find out they are 100% Ashkenazi Jewish. They were these, you know, 80 year old, Polish Catholic women. But not only did they learn that they were 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, but they had each other as top matches as full sisters. So they have the same parents and they never knew about each other until their 80s. So you can imagine kind of the reunion they had, but the next question obviously becomes who are their parents? So we got hold of their uh, case and this one took months. And we believe that we have determined the, their biological parents. I believe they've met their maternal second cousin, somebody who lives in Germany. Uh, that's their closest maternal match. And they have, um, we're still kind of working out, but they do have living first cousins in Israel uh, on the paternal side. Something I'd like to say about these kind of things too, is it's not ever just helping the clients, these sisters, or even their grandchildren who are so thankful for all the work we've done. Along the way, we've helped other people find each other when we're working on these cases. So one of the top matches for the sisters was a second cousin match. And she said, it must be this side of the family. It can't be this. We lost everybody in the Holocaust. So it ended up being, of course, that it was the family she believed lost everyone in the Holocaust. And she was second cousins to these sisters. Not only that, as we built the tree, and we were very, very fortunate, Yad Vashem had wonderful testimonies uh, there and other records we were able to find through J.R.I. Poland, but there was somebody in Australia that we needed to take a test to prove our theory that we had the right line. So uh, Jennifer got a contact with a Jewish, a Jewish Genealogical Society in Australia, and they knew who this person was. They did a whole name change. It was a whole thing. And we said, would you be willing to take a DNA test? And he said, oh, I already took one of those, those things. It just told me I was 100% Ashkenazi Jewish. And I said, have you turned on your matches? And this was on Ancestry. He turned on his matches and he was the top match for the sisters besides each other because wow. he was a second cousin. So now this cousin in Australia has this cousin in the United States who's second cousins and then these sisters. So it's really an international effort. And we're building these networks for people who didn't even directly address us and come to us in this process. So it's really a beautiful thing. And I, again, I could go on and on for hours uh, about these types of stories, but the type of closure and meaning that people get knowing that they're not the last people. I think the best quote to sum all of this up is I was uh, helping somebody doing this and she had no knowledge of a surname in her line of one of her grandparents. And one of her top matches was somebody with that surname. And it's not a common surname. The records, unfortunately, there's some holes in them, but we can tell they're probably second cousins. And the comment this cousin had, and they met each other, I think one lives in Israel and the other's in Paris. They met in Paris, something like that. But he said, it's like a cousin fell out of the sky. And wow. I really just love that. And they, so they're all meeting each other.
uh, as they do this and getting, re- we send them records. Some of them didn't have the, you know, they're, they're sending them their grandparents' marriage record. They thought it was all gone. Giving them that just gives, it empowers people. And that's what we think is the most important part of this project. Uh, you know, spreading knowledge, empowering people and giving them the closure they deserve. So. A couple more questions. So we're, uh, we're living in the fast moving 21st century. Yes. Uh, what's the, what's the future of genealogy? Oh, the future of genealogy. There are so many things. Um, I mean, there's, you, you might hear about AI. I think AI is a big part of genealogy right now. Uh, there's a lot of scary things that AI might be able to do, but something that would be great is if they can get AI to just read records and translate them and transcribe them for people, because there are so many records out there unindexed. You know, as I said, not everything's online. There's also a lot online that you have to kind of comb through and you have to know where to look. If you had AI, the ability to just kind of do it like that, you know, we'd have a lot more information. I think that's one. And then, you know, kind of separate from this, but something else I do is uh, working with law enforcement. I think there's a lot going on in the world with uh, DNA and law enforcement, which is a whole other topic, but that's definitely something on the horizon. But hopefully just more tools to make us able to interpret our DNA more efficiently. And hopefully as more people test, more connections, right? You never know. Next week, I could have another new big match that I have to work through. And that happens all the time. So I would just say it keeps on going. Where can our audience find out more about the DNA Reunion Project? Right. So uh, right now we're kind of in a place of transition as we're uh, moving from our pilot program. But you can definitely look at dna.cjh.org for any updates. You can also follow me. I'm all over social media at My Family Genie, uh, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram or MyFamilyGenie.com, whatever you prefer, I'm there. And that's really the best way to stay up to date with kind of the work that we're doing. Well, Adina, what you and uh, Jennifer are doing is a true mitzvah, not only for Holocaust survivors, but for their families and descendants, too. And a thank you also for filling in many of the blank spaces in our own family history. Um, I tried a little bit with that phone directory and a few Mm -hmm. other things, but you you've really um, uh, filled out the record, uh, and I know you're still working on it. So I, I get we- messages all the time from long lost cousins because it's called cousin bit. You post something about family online, and they find you. So I've gotten lots of I'll say Kvalis, uh relatives reaching out to us because of that. So well, wishing you continued success with the DNA reunion project and in uniting as many people as possible through your incredible efforts. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk about it today. Thank you for having me. Well, this concludes another episode of the Conversations with B'nai B'rith podcast. Thank you to my guest, Dr. Adina Newman, for joining us and to you for tuning in to our show. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. Share this episode with friends, post about it on social media, or leave us a comment or a rating. We love hearing from you. For all of our latest content, and if you haven't already, follow or subscribe to Conversations with B'nai B'rith wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. Stay tuned for more exciting content in our next episode. Till then, from my guest, Dr. Adina Newman, this is your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Take care, everyone.